So, now that you've watched the true cost, you might conclude that those of us in the US and the developed world in general often consume too much, far too much stuff. Not only clothes, but too much of everything, and that this is environmentally utterly unsustainable. So, this is a fair conclusion, which incidentally I think is squarely on the mark. Regarding what to do about this situation, you might further conclude that the solution is for most of us in the developed world to consume less, a lot less, of clothing and pretty much everything else. This is also a fair conclusion. Moreover, it's a useful one as we can all act upon it immediately by simply consuming, i.e. buying less. In that sense, this is more than little significant as it gives us something that each of us can do about a range of problems, from the social justice issues addressed in the true cost to the climate crisis itself. However, turning our attention to personal action risks turning away from the vast system that makes fast fashion possible. And I'm not just talking about the fashion industry. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Instead, I'm referring to the unchecked, outrageous uh, whole issue of consumerism itself. In my short intro to the true cost, I noted that all sorts of industries profit by our consumption. Hence, it is in their best interest to do everything that they can to encourage us, you know, toward rampant consumerism. If this sounds a little disturbing, it is, as it is clear that some industries will go to extraordinary lengths to keep us consuming. How extraordinary? Well, consider the tobacco industry. Since the 1920s, scientists have known that there was a link between cigarette smoking and cancer. By the 1950s, the American public was alerted to the problem through a series of articles entitled Cancer by the Carton in the Reader's Digest, which was an incredibly popular magazine at the time. By the end of the 1960s, all cigarettes sold in the U.S. were required to have a prominent label informing consumers that, quote, cigarette smoking can cause lung cancer and heart diseases. Knowing that they were selling a poisonous substance that was, moreover, addictive, what did they do? What did the tobacco industry do? Did they, horrified at what they had done, apologize to the public and immediately stop? To the contrary, they doubled down, denied the science, and did everything that they could to continue profiting from extraordinary human suffering for as many years, indeed decades, as possible. Even today, when a successful campaign has significantly reduced cigarette smoking in the United States over the past few decades, even today, half a million people in the U.S. die every year from smoking. Smokers, on average, die 10 years sooner than non-smokers. And then there is the fossil fuel industry, which has been selling us a product which they have known since the 1970s when Exxon, hi Exxon hired a range of scientists to study the problem. They've known that it was quickly bringing about global climate change. Did they, horrified at what they had done, you know, apologize to the public and immediately stop? To the contrary, they too doubled down, are denying the science and doing everything that they can to continue profiting from the destruction of our planet. This raises an obvious question. If we want to change the way the corporations act, how do we go about it? Of course, we can shop with our dollars, but something more is needed here, and we can't do it alone. It's, you know, it raises the question, you know, isn't there anyone looking out for us and the planet, protecting us from the tobacco industry, the fossil fuel industry, and, and well, protecting us you know, from unchecked industry in general? Well, there is, or at least should be, in the same way that our government protects us from things like armies that would invade our country, it should also be protecting us from all sorts of dangers and, I would add, do everything possible to ensure that ours is a just and fair land free of environmental devastation. Does the U.S. government, in fact, do that? Well, 100 years ago in the 1920s, the answer to this question would have been a decided no. Fifty years ago, the answer would have been, for the most part, a qualified yes. At least it was on the way to protecting us. And today, sadly, today we have swung back toward no. So, 100 years ago, American citizens were, for the most part, subjected to horrific working conditions. Companies could pay employees as little as they liked, did not have to provide safe working conditions, or retirement benefits, or health benefits, or really anything else. If you remember the sort of working conditions that we saw in Bangladesh and the true cost, you have some idea of what can happen when corporations are not required to see to the health and safety of their employees. Sadly, this was once the case in the U.S. But in the U.S., that largely changed in the 1930s. 
For the first time, a minimum wage was implemented in 1938. Three years before, in 1935, employees were given the right to collective bargaining and to strike through the National Labor Relations Act. That same year, retirement benefits were provided for everyone in the U.S. through the Social Security Act. This is just the tip of the iceberg as a range of similar programs were implemented in the U.S. during this time. In order to help finance these programs, tax on the wealthy, such as the Wealth Tax Act of 1935, required anyone making over $5 million per year to pay roughly four-fifths of it, i.e. four of the five million in taxes. In short, the federal government did an admirable job of wrestling control away from corporations to make the health and safety of Americans its number one priority. These sweeping policies, as you no doubt know, were known as the New Deal. Generally speaking, for the next 40 years, the federal government continued to advance the project of looking out for the well-being of its citizens. For example, 1971, OSHA, and that's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, was formed to, quote, ensure the safety and health and healthful working conditions for all Americans. That same year, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, also came into being. That focus on the safety and well-being of its U.S. citizens has gradually faded in the past 40 years. In contrast, corporations have become more and more powerful, and they have become more powerful. They've, as they become more powerful, they've had a profound influence on government policy. For example, tax law has been rewritten to benefit them. In 2017 and 2018, Amazon paid zero taxes, in spite of the fact that in 2018, Amazon reported a record profit of over $10 billion. If the Wealth um, Tax Act of 1935 applied here, roughly $8 billion of those dollars would have been paid in taxes, which could have in turn supported public programs to benefit everyone. Incidentally, in 2019, Amazon recorded an even greater profit of $14 billion. That year they paid taxes, not 80% in taxes, but rather just over 1%. In short, during the past 40 years, things have become better and better for corporations, while life has gotten significantly worse for the average U.S. citizen in a range of different ways. In contrast, in other countries, it has gotten better and better as they've continued to focus on the well-being of people, as did the New Deal, rather than of corporations. For example, let's consider Scandinavian countries. For the most part, their economies and cultures are built on something called the Nordic model. While these are, of course, democratic countries, they are also very much embraced things that were central to the New Deal, like collective bargaining and strong unions. Hence, they are sometimes called democratic socialist countries. Incidentally, France is another example of a democratic socialist country. But, but let's be very clear here, as these are not communist countries like the former Soviet Union or Mao's China. They are first and foremost democracies, which take the general project of the New Deal further than it developed in the U.S. between the 1930s and 70s. For example, they provide comprehensive health care for all of their citizens. Bernie Sanders nicely explains what these countries have to offer. So this is Bernie. So long as we know that democratic socialism, if we know what it is, we know that in countries in Scandinavia like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they are very democratic countries. Obviously they are. The voter, the voter turnout is a lot higher there than it is in the United States. In those countries, health care is the right of all people. And in those countries, college education is free. Graduate school is free. In those countries, retirement benefits, child care are stronger than in the United States of America. And in those countries, by and large, government works for ordinary people in the middle class rather than, as is the case right now in our country, the U.S., for the billionaire class. In fact, so that was Bernie, the average person in Sweden who makes almost as much money as the average person in the U.S. works five days a week, six hours a day. That's right, the average work week in Sweden is 30 hours a week. Only a very tiny percentage of people, 1%, work more than 50 hours per week. By contrast, 40% of Americans work more than 50 hours per week. Half of them work 60 hours per week. Hence, one in five Americans literally works twice as many hours per week as the average Swede, although on average we do not make much more money. Everyone in Sweden receive, receives 35 paid vacation days. That's five full weeks per year. Larger companies typically offer even more. 
All parents receive 480 days of paid paternity leave to split between them. So as there are 235 working days per year in Sweden, that's one year of paternity leave for each parent. So I'm not saying that life in Sweden is perfect. There are problems there like everywhere else. But look at the relative climate impact between Sweden and the U.S. Everything else being equal, the average Swede has a carbon footprint that's a quarter of the average American. But everything is not equal, as it's a much colder climate. Americans living in a comparable climate, and that would be Alaska, are emitting twice as much carbon dioxide as our nation's average. Hence, adjusted for their colder climate, the average Swede may well be emitting something like one eighth of a comparable American's green, greenhouse gas emissions. So currently, the average person in Sweden is responsible for four and a half metric tons of CO2 per year. If, for reasons of argument, we adjust that for the average American climate, it would be cut in half to a little over two metric tons of CO2 per year, which would be right where we would need to be to meet the goals of the Paris Accord signed to COP21. We're often told that adapting to climate change will mean that we have to leave drab lives of deprivation and require us to do without quite a bit. The Nordic model suggests otherwise. So during my introduction to the film Happy, I'm going to explore this further, but it's worth noting that in a recent study, we found out that in the United States, that the U.S. ranked number 19 in terms of happiness worldwide. In contrast, the five countries with the happiest people on the planet, that's Finland, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and the Netherlands, are all economies based on the northern democratic socialist model. In other words, while we can all do things like consume less in order to curtail industry, like fast fashion, we need to do more if we hope to mitigate climate crisis. In fact, we need to take on the job of changing the way our government works so that it's a true democracy that prioritizes citizens and justice, and the way that it once did in America not so long ago, started by the New Deal. And it should also, of course, prioritize the planet and its climate all over corporate interests. This would have profound implications. Not only would it dramatically help mitigate the climate crisis, it would likely make us all considerably happier in the bargain. In order to understand the situation further, this week we are watching a documentary on free market capitalism as it currently exists in the 21st century. It is based on the best-selling book Capital in the 21st Century by French economist Thomas Piketty. It is also a bit of a history lesson as it explains how we got here over recent centuries and decades. And don't worry, it only looks like it's going to be in French. It's by and large in English. Um, if you've already seen it, please instead watch you know, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate, um, which is a film based on a book by Naomi Klein. In short, think of capital, the documentary, as the true, the true cost part two that gets to the root of the problem, which is not us consumers, but the system that encourages and deeds demands rampant consumerism. Yes, we should, of course, all buy less, but we also need to address and fundamentally change the underlying economic, socioeconomic structure at work here. Okay, thanks.